Hello, I'm John Mack, and I'm delighted to be hosting tonight's premiere performance of Solos, a co-production of the Hooker Dunham Theater and the Rock River Players. It features and showcases local actors in monologues, soliloquies, poetry, and perhaps a bit of music. These performances are all filmed here live in the Hooker Dunham Theater, which, as you must know, is currently closed due to the pandemic. And so we're doing the next best, best thing. We're bringing these videos home to you. I want to thank Vaman Madhavi for his superb job producing this first edition and directing many of the pieces which you'll see tonight. And I want you to be aware that there are several new shows coming up in the pipeline. We have Michael Fox Kennedy, Adrian Major, Ron Boslin, Bill Forshian, and myself performing their individual acts. Uh, those can be tracked by coming to the Hooker Dunham website and just sign up for our newsletter and you'll be sure never to miss a new show premiere. Tonight, we have a wonderful array of individual pieces. The works of the classics, Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, George Bernard Shaw, among others, as well as original pieces, including one that was expressly created for this solo's performance. So lean back, relax, and enjoy the show. Rose Watson performs Always Ridiculous. The scene is a country house in Andalusia, Spain. It is day and the garden is filled with sunlight. You can say what you want, Don Cosme. I can't agree that Terracina is quite as complex as you think she is. And I'm certainly not prone to illusions. I know the world. I'm not an ingenuous child. Good Lord, I say that because no widow has any right to be one. Although, I must say that as far as years go and looks and manner, I am still somewhat of a child. But that's because of certain characteristics. Don't you agree? Why don't you speak? You know my character. Lord, the man's asleep again, up at 10 this morning, and now it's 11, and he sleeps. No, sir, I must have someone to talk to. Teresina's out in the garden, flirting with the two of them, spinning like a planet between her two poles, Juan and Eugenio. Don Pablo, he's out on his usual walk. And Don Hilarion, who knows where he is? And here I am left with Don Cosme, and he sleeps, leaving me in full monologue. I won't stand for it. I came to this house on the express condition that I should not be bored, and that condition is not being met. Oh, the place is beautiful. Art, oh, art. Pictures, 
tapestries, statues, bronze, porcelains, and nature. A great deal of nature, woods, flowers, lakes, waterfalls, and sunsets. But all of that is not enough. There's no warmth. As they say nowadays, the warmth of humanity. And he goes on sleeping. This life is giving that man softening of the brain. Don Cosme, Don Cosme, open your eyes. Jonathan Kinnersley performs Milo the Cat. Don't look at me like that. I can always tell when you humans are having a bad day. <laughs> like it's my fault for sleeping. Do I give you a hard time for only sleeping eight hours? Or for sleeping when you should be feeding me? No. So leave me alone. <sighs> oh, <laughs> I suppose if you're going to pet me. No, not the butt! Curse you, human! I was in such a comfortable position. <laughs> that does feel nice, though. Now, yeah, all right. Ooh, that's good. Oh. Getting bored now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Man, it's like you don't know what you're doing. Petting is not about you, sir, you hairless pink popsicle. Hmm. Now, bring me food. Hey, not that dry garbage. Bring me something wet that makes the whole house smell like tuna. I cannot fathom the inane stupidity of humans. It's like they can't understand basic commands. Hey, did I say go get some ice cream and stuff your fat face? No. It's like when I meow at you and you back at me. <laughs> I'm trying to speak to you in a language that you might be able to understand, not to get you to try and repeat it. <sighs> Maybe you just don't understand how communication works. If you did, then maybe you would get that I want to be petted on the head, not picked up ooh, or touched on the belly. It's not like it's that hard to remember. <sighs> morons. I'm surrounded by morons. <laughs> you know, sometimes it seems like they almost think that they're in charge or something. <laughs> <laughs> John Orgozalek performs Edgar Allan Poe's classic poem, Annabelle Lee. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this is the reason 
that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee. So that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that is the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that a wind came out of a cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who are older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. So all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Annie Landenberger performs the role of Madame Ranevsky from Anton Chevkov's The Cherry Orchard. She recalls the sins of her past, her trials and her losses, all perhaps a fitting prelude to her current state. She is about to lose her stature, her country estate, and her beloved cherry orchard to debt and to realignment of Russia's ideology. Please don't leave. I want you. Anyway, it's much gayer here when you're around. I keep feeling as if something's about to happen. As if the whole house is about to tumble down around our heads. <laughs> oh, we have been very, very sinful. The sins I have committed. I would always squander money, like a mad woman. And I married a man who made nothing but debt. My husband drank himself to death on champagne. He was a frightful, frightful drinker. As for my own sins, I, uh, I fell in love. And I ran off with another man. And then immediately, Immediately, my first punishment came, and it was like a blow on the head. Right here, in this river. My little boy drowned, and I, uh, I went abroad right away, right, right away never to see this place anymore, never to see that river again. I shut my eyes and I ran like a mad woman. And he followed me, pitiless and cruel. And then I, I bought a villa at Mentone because he fell sick there and uh, for three years, day and night, he tormented me. That very sick man tormented me and he wore down my soul. So when they sold my villa to pay my debt, I went off to Paris and he came after me. He robbed me of everything and then he left. He ran away with another woman and I I tried to poison myself, but <laughs> it was all so stupid, so pitiful. And then suddenly I longed to be back in Russia, 
to be in my country again with my little girl. Oh, Lord, Lord, please be merciful. Forgive me my sins. Oh, God. Please don't punish me anymore. I, uh, I received this today from Paris. He asks for forgiveness. He begs me to come back. <laughs> Tino Benson performs the Meaning of Life. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Rudolf Watts, a British philosopher who, under normal circumstances, would be traveling the world giving talks on stage. But tonight, he is coming to us live from his personal study in Kent, England. Have you ever heard the story of the Chinese farmer? No? Well, it goes like this. Long ago, in ancient China, there was a humble farmer who lived a simple life at his homestead. One day, his one and only horse got loose and ran away. When the news of what had happened spread throughout the village, all the neighbors came around to his house and said, We're so sorry you lost your one and only horse. You must feel awful. It's too bad. And the farmer simply shrugged his shoulders and said, Maybe. The next day, the horse returned and brought with it seven more healthy horses. As the dust settled from the horse's heavy galloping, the farmer could see that his neighbors were running along a few hundred yards behind, eager to share their congratulations. When they finally arrived at his house, they said, Your horse came back and brought with it seven more healthy horses? You must feel overjoyed! Isn't it wonderful? And the farmer just yawned and said, hmm, Maybe. The next day, the farmer's son was attempting to tame one of the wild horses. He managed to mount it and successfully rode it for several minutes. He was fully convinced that the horse was broken in. But as the farmer's son was returning to the stables, the horse suddenly bucked him off, breaking his leg. The news quickly spread from door to door all throughout the village, and all the neighbors came around to his house with distressed looks on their faces and said, Your son broke his leg trying to tame one of the wild horses. You must feel terrible. It's too bad. And the farmer just looked off at the setting sun and said, Maybe. The next day, the conscription officers from the Imperial City arrived looking for recruits for the army. They recruited almost all of the neighbor's sons. When they finally came knocking at the farmer's door, they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. As the officers left with their new recruits, all the neighbors came around to his house and said, they took my son. They took mine too. But your son was spared because he broke his leg. You must feel so blessed. Isn't it wonderful? And the farmer simply said, Maybe. Now, what could the farmer possibly have meant by his nonchalant remarks? Did he not recognize the significance of what was happening in his life? Was this farmer a complete fool or a sage hidden in plain sight? <laughs> now, let us entertain for a moment the idea that this farmer, in fact, had some wisdom to share with the villagers. The farmer made the keen observation that life doesn't come to us with a package insert, explaining all of the core principles that we must adhere to and the various things that we should deem as good or bad. His responses neither contested nor supported their conclusions. 
he left the door open to their interpretations which in and of itself subtly pointed to a very simple truth, that life has no inherent meaning, and that we decide, if we so choose, what our own personal meaning of life can be. Ultimately, meaning is optional. It is not a necessity for the functions of life as we can see so clearly in nature. The leaves sprout forth from little sleeping buds and then grow into lush and vibrant hues of green, then metamorphose into burning red, golden yellow and amber orange, before finally withering into brown and falling to the earth to decompose, all without the need for our interpretations. Seeing the world as inherently neutral provides ample breathing room for us to observe the happenings of life and then from that place of observation decide how we would like to relate to it. Now, with that being said, were the farmer's neighbours wrong in their interpretation of the situation? Not at all. They were simply choosing their meaning to imprint upon the experience. However, they most likely didn't realize that it was exactly that, a choice. You see, for much of humanity, this vital ability to choose our own meaning has been hidden from us by the conditioning of society. Social constructs dictate from an early and impressionable age which clothes, occupations, and personal pastimes are good, and which ones are bad. They dictate our meanings associated with race, with gender, with age, with mental illness, and with so many other aspects of our lives. By the time we've become adults, we've hardly created a fraction of the meanings that we so adamantly adhere to. This conditioning happens on every level, from the macro to the micro. Various decisions are made by the government entities of the world, while other choices are made by our friends, our families, our communities, our religion, and our social states. Much like the villagers in the story, the way in which we interpret reality has already been decided for us. We become like a flock of birds running around and chirping, oh, that's too bad, and isn't it wonderful, to just about everything that happens, whether we are aware of it or not. It almost seems impossible not to automatically assign these meanings to our lives. But here's the kicker. Once we become aware of the source of so many of our heavily ingrained beliefs about reality and recognize that they are not necessarily our own personal choices, then and only then can we begin to let go of those that no longer benefit us. We can begin to regain our autonomy, our personal agency, to decide how we would like to relate to the world and everything we experience. No longer being at the whim of how we have been conditioned to interpret reality. We are free to be like the farm, neutral and unattached, and open to true contentment. Tom Ely performs the Inquisitor's monologue from George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan. The Inquisitor, as the leading prosecutor for the Holy Inquisition, speaks to the bishop and court just prior to Joan being brought in for trial. He responds to a young Dominican, Brother Martin, who asks, but is there any great harm in the girl's heresy? Is it not merely her simplicity? Many saints have said as much as Joan. Brother Martin, if you had seen what I have seen of heresy, you would not think it a light matter, even in its most apparently harmless and even lovable and pious origins. Heresy begins with people who are, to all appearances, better than their neighbors. A pious young girl, or a young man who 
follows our Lord's command by giving all his riches to the poor, putting on the garb of poverty, the life of austerity, the rule of charity and humility may be the founder of a heresy that would wreck both church and empire if not ruthlessly stamped out in time. The records of the Holy Inquisition are filled with histories we dare not give to the world, for they are beyond the belief of honest men and innocent women. Yet they all began with saintly simpletons. I have seen this again and again. Mark what I say. The woman who quarrels with her clothes and puts on the dress of a man is like a man who throws off his fur gown and dresses like John the Baptist. They are followed as surely as the night follows the day by bands of wild women and men who refuse to wear any clothes at all. When maids will no longer marry or take regular vows, and when men reject marriage and exalt their lust to divine inspiration, then surely as summer follows the spring, surely as summer follows the spring, they begin with polygamy and end by incest. Heresy at first seems innocent, even laudable, yet, yet it ends in such a monstrous horror of unnatural wickedness that even the most tender-hearted among you, if you saw it at work as I have, would clamor against the church's mercy in dealing with it. For 200 years, the Holy Office has striven against these diabolical madnesses, and it knows that they begin always by vain and ignorant persons setting up their own judgments against the church and taking it upon themselves to be the interpreters of God's will. You must not fall into the common error of mistaking these simpletons for liars and hypocrites. They believe their diabolical inspiration is divine. Therefore, you must be on your guard against your own natural compassion. Gentlemen, you are all, I hope, merciful men. How else could you have devoted your entire lives to the service of our gentle Savior? You will see before you a young girl, pious and chaste. For I must tell you, gentlemen, that the words spoken of her by our English friends are supported by no evidence. Whilst there is abundant testimony that her excesses are excesses of religion and charity, not worldliness and wantonness. This girl is not like those whose hard features are signs of hard hearts, and whose brazen looks and lewd demeanor condemn them before they are accused. The devilish pride that has led her into her present peril has left no mark on her countenance. Strange as it may seem to you, it has left no mark on her character either. So you will see before you a diabolical pride and a natural humility seated side by side in the self-same soul. Therefore, be on your guard.
God forbid that I, I should tell you to harden your hearts. <laughs> For her punishment, should we condemn her, would be so cruel so as to forfeit our own hope of divine mercy, were there one grain of malice against her in our hearts. But if you hate cruelty, and if any man here does not hate it, I command him on his soul's salvation to quit this holy court. I say, if you hate cruelty, remember, nothing is as cruel in its consequences as the toleration of heresy. Remember also that no court of law is as cruel as the common people are to those whom they suspect of heresy. The heretic in the hands of the holy office is safe from violence, assured of a fair trial, and cannot suffer death even when guilty if repentance follows sin. Innumerable lives of heretics have been saved because the holy office took them out of the hands of the people and because the people yielded them up knowing that the holy office would deal with them. Before the Holy Inquisition existed, and even now when its officers are out of reach, the unfortunate wretch suspected of heresy, perhaps unjustly and ignorantly, is stoned, torn to pieces, drowned, burned in his own house with his innocent children, without a trial, unshriven, unburied, save as a dog is buried. All of them acts hateful to God and most cruel to man. Gentlemen, I am compassionate by nature as well as by my profession. And though the work I have to do may seem cruel to those who do not know how much more cruel it would be to leave it undone, I myself would go to the stake sooner than do it if I did not know its righteousness, its necessity, its essential mercy. I ask you to address yourselves to this trial in that conviction. Anger is a bad counselor. Cast out anger. Pity is sometimes worse. Cast out pity. But do not cast out mercy. Remember only that justice must come first. Have you anything to add, my lord, before we proceed to trial? Dan Lloyd performs The Stranger's Speech, written by William Shakespeare in Sir Thomas More, an unpublished, multi-authored Elizabethan play. The year, 1517. An angry mob gathers, citizens demanding removal of immigrants and refugees who, they claim, are taking their jobs and their resources. Sir Thomas More, as sheriff of the city, reasons with the mob. What is it you would get? For say we grant you get the thing you seek. Grant them remove. Grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silenced by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What did you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought, 
with self same hand, self reason and self right would shark on you. And men, like ravenous fishes, feed on one another. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to pull them like a hound. For say now the king should banish you, whither would you go? What country by nature of your error should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal? Nay, anywhere that not adheres to England, why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you a place on earth? Wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owned not nor made not you, nor that the elements were not all appropriate to your comforts, but rather chartered unto them. What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case. And this, your mountainish inhumanity. Cameron Cobain performs the opening soliloquy of William Shakespeare's Richard III. In this soliloquy, Richard cozies up to us, the audience, letting us know exactly what he feels about his brother's reign, the current peace, and some of his reasons for plotting against both. He revels in the pure pleasure of matching his own subtle plots against those who are not his equals, either in intellect or in evil. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this sun of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures, Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front. Now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearsome adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. <laughs> but I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that so lamely the dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. Therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am, subtle, false, and treacherous, then this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer shall be. Fly thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. 